All right. Um, want to thank everyone for making time to come out and join us today. Um, this is our first call of 2024. Uh, excited for a great lineup that we have. Um, so today um, we'll get a brief introduction from me, then we'll hear about ear leaf acacia from Dr. Mintier, um, and get an update on East Central Florida Sisma from Dr. Wells, and a few updates on what's going around on around the state. Um, so getting into our feature presentation, Dr. Carrie Mintier received her master's degree in biology and her PhD in entomology from the University of Arkansas. Dr. Mintier is now an assistant professor at the University of Florida Indian River Research and Education Center in Fort Pierce, where she leads a research program focusing on the biological control of invasive plants. Dr. Mintier specializes in invasion ecology and biological control. She has particular interest in developing sustainable control methods for invasive plant species, integrating classical biological control with other weed management techniques and educating the public about invasive species. All right, mm. and at this point, I will go ahead and hand the presentation over to her. Okay. All right, everything looks good. Uh, thanks Deb for the, uh, for the introduction. So, uh, like Deb said, we're going to talk a little bit about ear leaf acacia in Florida, a little bit about kind of where we are with the um, with the biological control program and kind of what what the species distribution looks like in the state. So ear leaf acacia is a um, very large tree that's native to Australia, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. It was introduced into Florida in the 1930s. Uh, as a parkway tree. People liked it to have this fast growing, beautiful tree in their front yard and along their streets. Uh, these trees can occur in open areas with high water tables, usually kind of wildland bordering areas and disturbed areas. It's allelopathic, so it can actually use what I like to call it plant chemical warfare. So it can actually secrete chemicals into the uh, into the environment that inhibits the germination and growth of other plant species. These plants are in the Fabaceae, so they're legume plants. Um, legumes are notorious for being able to fix nitrogen, so the, these plants can actually alter nitrogen cycling because of this ability to fix nitrogen from the environment. Um, this can be, of course, problematic in low nutrient systems like, like the Everglades. Uh, like I said, it's a very fast growing, very large tree. So these trees grow from about 15 to 30 meters tall. So very large trees and extremely fast growing. So here's a picture of my graduate student, Sara Salgado. And Sara's uh, about five foot eight. Uh, that tree's three years old. So it is a very fast growing tree. It also has early reproductive maturity, so uh, these plants can start to flower and produce viable fruit by year two. And uh, what we have found so far is that these see these trees can produce about 80,000 seeds per tree. So these are fairly young trees still, so that number might actually increase. Um, before we started working on this project, the literature suggested that these trees would produce about 27,000 seeds. So we are finding that these are many, uh, producing many more seeds than what we previously thought. But the story for early acacia actually begins with a plant that's not early acacia. So many of you all will know uh, the Tame Melaleuca program. It was a very successful uh, landscape level program uh, looking to reduce the amount of Melaleuca in Florida. This is a multi-agency uh, control program, and it was very, very successful. Well, Malaluca is another Australian tree that occurs in very similar or the same habitats as early acacia. So this program was started in 2001. And what we see is occurring is what we call the invasive treadmill. So where you're removing one plant species or one invasive and another invasive is coming into uh, to replace it. And in this case, is early acacia. They um, very similar habits, they occur in the same types of habitats. In fact, this was the distribution of ear leaf acacia in Florida in 1993. So all of those yellow dots are um, a, a, a place where we've seen the plant. In 2003, we of course are spreading a little bit further, right? Invasive plants will spread um, over time. 
And so this is two years after the start of tame Melaleuca. So as we're starting to remove a lot of these Melaleuca trees from the environment. And in 2023, this is what the distribution looked like. So you can tell in between 2003 and 2023, these this species have just have exploded in Southern Florida. And in fact, so this is the current distribution of earlyfication in the state. So all of those green uh, counties do have earlyfication present. But this is the um, distribution uh, using um, climate modeling. So these are the areas in the darker green are the areas that we believe that earlyfication has the ability to spread into. And we don't want that to happen. We want to be able to hold this plant back to um, so that it won't reach its full distribution potential. So current control methods for that, what we're doing is um, mechanical control. So we're hand pulling seedlings and then removing mature trees. It's really important when you're removing mature trees to get the roots out as well, because these things can sprout from the roots very, very easily. We're also doing chemical control, so cut stump with uh, garlon and milestone and basal bark treatments. That's the current control methods right now. You have all probably seen this invasion curve a hundred times um, it, over your lifetime or at least your time in invasion science. And so this is not something, something new. So control methods, we do different control methods in different areas of the curve, right? So when you're in the eradication phase, you're going to do mechanical and chemical controls, right? You really want to get these things out of there because you're trying to eradicate them. Um, then you move into the containment phase. We're still doing mechanical and chemical controls. We're just trying to keep that species contained into, into fewer areas, right? We can no longer eradicate it. It's continuing to spread. Control costs are going up. Um, and areas infested are going up. Um, so we're still doing a lot of chemical and mechanical controls there. Cultural controls will often be used here as well. And then when you get into this kind of red area, this resource protection and long-term management section of the curve, that is when we're usually trying or starting to discuss biological control. So biological controls oh, okay. of invasive plants take a I'm long time. I'm worried about to that too and so uh, they usually take about 10 years. And so if we're waiting until this area of the curve, we're actually kind of behind the eight ball on this, right? Um, we've got this plant is everywhere. It's damaging the environment and the economy. And uh, we still have another 10 years before we will have a viable agent. So what we're trying to do with early vacation and with future programs is to move this bubble a little further down the invasion curve so that we're getting started much earlier so that we can get these biological control agents out before we have, before it is spread everywhere. So the first step in that is to figure out what is currently eating early vacation in Florida. And to do that, we have an early vacation uh, grove here at the Indian River Research and Education Center where we planted 50 early vacation trees. So these were planted back in June of 2019. Half of these trees are protected by an, um, a systemic insecticide so that we can measure the difference in growth between plants that are protected and plants that are out there being fed upon by whatever insects are feeding upon them. So we monitor the growth every six months. We monitor stem diameter, height, um, canopy area, the number of seeds are produced, and um, and monitor insect damage. So what are, what are those uh, leaves of that tree looking like, right? How much insect damage do they have on them? Quarterly, we also do insect surveys. So we go out to find out which insects are actually occurring on these trees uh, so that we know what kind of damage they're doing, who isn't doing the damage, and is that translating to any reduction in growth? And what we found so far is we only have a handful of insects that actually occur on this plant. So the first is Strader libatus. Uh, it is a chrysomelid, so a leaf beetle. We've got Myloceris or the Sri Lankan weevil, the citrus root weevil, um, our favorite love bugs. Uh, we have uh, this super cute thorn bug and we have a, a psyllid. So if you know anything about insects, uh, you know that the only native one we have is this one. Uh, so Strider lumbatus is the, the leaf feeding beetle. All of the other insects that we've found so far occurring on this tree or feeding on this tree 
are non-native and a majority of them, so the ones up here on the top, are, are invasive. Um, thorn bugs can be problematic. I don't know if I'd necessarily consider them invasive. But this psyllid here is actually brand new to science. In fact, it didn't have a name until about six months ago. And we found the this psyllid occurring on yearly facacia in, in the state. Every, pretty much everywhere we find yearly facacia, we find this psyllid. So let's talk about straighter lambeta. So this is our native uh, beetle. It's actually native to the southwestern U.S., not to Florida, but since it's native to the U.S., we're going to consider, consider it native. It's typically in dry and hot environments. Um, so it's also native to Mexico and northern South America. In 2019, we found this beetle emerging from seeds and ear leaf acacia. And so we got a little video of one trying to come out here. Um, so we've seen these emerging from the seeds. You can tell here on this seed, we've got another emergence hole along with where that he's trying to come out right now. So you can get multiple beetles in each seed. And so we started to look into this. And in 2022, we found that these beetles infest about 15% of the early facacia seeds in 2022. In 2023, that increased to a little over 22% of the early facacia seeds. So that's good. We've got something that's uh, feeding on these seeds. We did uh, some germination trials and we found that any seeds that had a beetle emerge from them, 0% of them uh, germinated. So that's great. We currently have 22.5% um, of the seeds that have these beetles in them and none of those seeds will germinate. So it's basically a 22% reduction in the seeds, right? And that's awesome. We are super great. We are super happy to see that. We don't know if necessarily that will translate to a reduction in spread. So, you know, 22.5% of 80,000 seeds, you still have a whole lot of, of um, viable seed there. And these seeds are very viable. We we get nearly 100% germination on early facacia seeds that don't have the beetles. Okay. So we know what's feeding on it. We know what kind of damage we're seeing. Um, is this insect damage affecting the growth of the tree? And what we're seeing is, uh, so in the upper left-hand corner, we got stem diameter that we measured. The, um, like the pink or reddish lines are the control trees. So these are the trees that have your insect damage. And the teal lines are trees that are protected by the insecticide. So you can tell a uh, stem diameter, height, and canopy volume, there are no differences between the, the plants that are protected by the insecticide and those that are uh, freely fed upon by insects. Um, on the bottom right-hand corner, this is average damage, so insect damage that we have um, systematically gone through and evaluated. There is a difference in the amount of insect damage on the trees that have insects and on the trees that are protected by insecticides. So you do get a little feeding on those um, systemic insecticide treated plants because the insect actually has to feed to die. Um, but there is a higher amount of damage on the trees that don't have the insecticide. Even though there's a higher amount of damage, this is still not translating to a reduction in growth of these plants. So what does this mean? Is insect damage affecting growth? Absolutely not, at least not up to the point we've seen. We're going to continue monitoring these for the next several years. But with these results paired with the fact that we are already doing mechanical controls and cultural or mechanical controls and chemical controls for this plant species, and the plant species is still spreading very, very rapidly in the state, that shows us that biological control agents are necessary, right? We need to get some more insects in here to really be able to reduce the spread and growth of this plant species. And we started that back in 2015. So okay. biological control takes on average about 10 years to be able to um, find a target, find insects, test insects, and, and get permits, right, for release. So we started this back in 2015. This is a collaborative project between my lab here at UF, Melissa Smith's lab at USDA ARS, and um, CSIRO, which is uh, the Australian USDA, basically. Um, so CSIRO 
started doing these quarterly surveys. So this map is Northern Australia. You've got in the West, Western part of that uh, graph, that is the Northern Territory area. And on the Eastern part of that graph, that is the Queensland area. What we did was visual inspections and beach sheets, higher branches of the tree were cut down to see uh, what we're feeding there. And what we were looking for were insects that belonged in feeding guilds that have been successful in controlling acacias in other areas of the world, like um, leaf gallers and things like this. Um, and then arthropods that were in very high densities and or inflicting high levels of damage to, to ear leaf acacia, right? So we want to look for um, insect species that are related to ones that have been successful in the past, as well as insects that look like they're very, very damaging on the trees in the native range. And what we found is we found 89 different arthropods and one pathogen occurring on these trees in its native range. And we'll talk about a few of these today. So the first one is Calamella and Tamarata. It is a chrysomelid beetle, so just like our Strider lambatus that we saw earlier. Um, so these uh, are very cute lime green, got these beautiful pink underwings. Uh, they occur in both the Northern Territory and the Queensland areas of Australia. Our trees, we did some genetic sampling, actually came from the Northern Territory. So we think the Northern Territory beetles are going to be the best um, choice to, to release, but we have both biotypes just to make sure. Uh, these beetles feed on new leaves. They were imported into quarantine labs in Florida in 2018. So both my lab and Melissa Smith's lab in Fort Lauderdale. And what we're currently doing is host range studies, making sure they only eat ear leaf acacia, doing biology studies, looking at, you know, whether or not they're going to be able to survive in Florida or not. Uh, and then investigating the differences between the two biotypes, right? So we think that Northern Territory beetles are going to be best matched for our plants because our plants come from the Northern Territory. But we need to make sure that, that one of them isn't going to survive better in Florida or be more damaging on the plant. So this is the uh, host range. This is just a snapshot. This is not all of them. We have 127 different species to test. Um, we're about three fourths of the way through. So um, this is just a, a snapshot of the species. We have to test both the larvae and the adults on these on these uh, insects because both larvae and the adults feed. And so we have to test both. So it doubles the amount of tests we have to do. Um, but what we found so far is that these beetles will not feed and develop on any plant species other than early vacacia. And so um, we're very happy with that. Now we're testing things that are distantly related. And so the chances that we're going to find something there that they're going to feed upon is, um, is, is the chances are very low. So um, so I, we think that this guy is going to be um, very host specific or host specific enough to uh, to release. We looked at uh, temperature dependent development. So how long these things take to develop at different temperatures. So we did these um, with both biotypes. So we've got the development time in days on your y-axis and then the temperatures we have tested. Uh, so what we found is that it takes less time to develop on, at 32 degrees than it does 20, which is to be expected. Insects develop more quickly at warmer temperatures. We did not see a difference between the biotypes. So um, the Queensland biotype and the Northern Territory biotype um, react similarly in, in these conditions. So we think that um, both these things are going to be fine to release out in Florida. Um, we've done some cooler temperatures to make sure that, um, that these things are going to do fine in the winter. And we think they're going to be just fine. So Calamella is host specific. It has the ability to survive in Florida climate. Impact studies are nearly finished. So hopefully we'll have those finished in the next several months. Uh, but it looks like these are also very damaging on the plant. And we're planning on submitting a petition for release this year in 2024. So very likely uh, towards the end of the year. But um, so we'll we'll get that submitted. So releases to begin, uh, if it gets approved, and it's very likely that it will be approved, We'll probably get um, we'll probably get permits about 2027. So it does take many years after all of the research is finished 
to actually be handed a release permit. So be looking for that on the um, nearest, nearest horizon. We do have another insect in quarantine right now. This is trichologaster. It doesn't, it doesn't, it is yet to have a full scientific name. So it's being identified right now by a taxonomist. A uh, trichologaster, um, insects in this genus are very good at controlling acacias. There's several biological control programs for acacias where trichologaster is a very effective agent. And so um, this is Sara Salgado's PhD work. These are bud galling insects. So they gall um, leaf buds and flower buds and, and produce these very impressive galls on these plants. These galls act as a nutrient sink for the plant. So actually pulling resources away from growth and reproduction. And so um, many trichologaster species are very successful at reducing spread um, and vigor of these, of these plant species. Uh, so Sara, uh, we just started host range testing of these um, these insects about a year ago. So we're not quite as far along as Calamella, but so far it's looking great. Uh, we haven't gotten any development on any plant species other than early Vacacia, but these are much further behind than, than uh, Calamella is. So biocontrol summary, Calamella, um, all of our studies are nearing completion. It looks great. We're really excited about this and we're gonna submit uh, petitions for release in 2024. Trichologaster, we've got um, these things underway, but we don't know when we're gonna uh, be able to submit that petition. Uh, but we need your help. So early vacatia is spreading very, very rapidly in the state, as you saw from some of those earlier maps. And so what we have done, we have put together an iNaturalist uh, project to be able to get people out in the state, especially in the areas where this thing, kind of that leading edge of the infestation, are really moving quickly. So if you scan that QR code, it will take you directly to our iNaturalist project. So you can sign up for a, um, an account in iNaturalist. If you already have one, it will just allow you to sign up for our project. And what this does is every time you're out and you see early vacation, you snap a little photo, you upload it into the system, and it will go immediately to our, our project so that we will know that somebody has mapped this thing somewhere in, in the state. Um, we need these distribution maps for um, for many reasons. Number one, it can inform control activities, right? Like this leading edge of this infestation is moving very, very quickly. And the people that are actually working with this plant species can't be everywhere at once. And so with help from, from others in the state, we'll know precisely where that leading edge is. And so we can get control activities out there to try to slow the spread. Um, this will also help to plan for biocontrol releases, right? If we have the full picture of the distribution, we will know where we can strategically put biological control agents once they are ready um, and permitted for release. Once these things are permitted for release, we can then monitor spread establishment and impact of agents because we have a better picture of where these ends or where these the host plant is. So as like I said before, this is an iNaturalist project. So a lot of people, it's a very popular um, app that people use to uh, get things identified, to map things. Uh, and bonus, uh, iNaturalist things now get automatically uploaded into EdMaps. And so a lot of land managers and things are using EdMaps. And so by uploading it into the iNaturalist system, it automatically goes over into the EdMap system. And so um, whichever one you choose to use, both of them will be uh, will be up to date. I don't do this work alone, obviously. So I have to thank um, our funding agencies. So uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife, um, the Florida Department of Agriculture and the Florida Invasive Species Council all generously support the work that we do here. Um, these are the lovely people in my lab that are actually in the lab working with these things every single day. I could not do it without them. And uh, here is my contact info and social media for the lab. If you want to follow, if you want to 
get up to date information on when we can release these guys. If you're if you have a lot of ear lubrication, maybe you want them. And there's the QR code again for uh, if you want to join our iNaturalist program. I please help to uh, get more points of this thing on the map. It is spreading so very quickly. Uh, seven years ago, when I started at University of Florida, Fort Pierce was the leading edge of ear leaf acacia in the state. Now it is up past Kissimmee. I see it uh, when I'm up in Kissimmee regularly. So um, it is spreading very, very quickly. And we definitely need your help to uh, to be able to track it. So if I have time for questions, I guess I'll take some questions. Yes, we have time. Thank you very much. Um, that was a great presentation. We have some questions already. So first, um, have you tested that the insects won't affect our native uh, Vachelia farnesiana, the sweet acacia? So um, when we test plant species, we have we start off with the most closely related. So anything that's in that same plant family that is native and occurs in North America. So Mexico, Canada, United States, and we also do the Caribbean. So yeah, so we've definitely we have definitely tested those and we've tested all of those um, extremely closely related plants and didn't get feeding or reproduction on any of them. So very host specific. Okay, thank you. Um, so someone commented that they have a lot there in uh, Port St. Lucie, but they don't have a smartphone and, and can't use iNaturalist. Are there other ways that people can get location information to you if they're not able to get into the iNaturalist group? Yep, they can um, email me um, location information. If you turn, if you don't have a smartphone, you don't have that. But yeah, you can get you can get it to me by addresses, by GPS points. You know, feel free to email me, give me a call. Um, whatever is is easiest. Okay. And they left contact information in the uh, chat, and I'll make sure to get that to you today as well, too. Thanks, Deb. Um, We have another question that um, it's been in South Florida for a very long time. Is there a catalyst causing it to spread more rapidly north in recent years? Well, yeah. I mean, so, you know, invasives, there's usually a lag period right? So like a lag period where you just kind of, it's just kind of there. It's not really doing anything. And you just kind of like have to build up, you know, the pressure, right? Like the propagule pressure to get it to spread. So um, with early vacation, we have overcome that lag phase now for sure. Um, so when you start to get more trees, they produce more seeds and it spreads more quickly, as well as the fact that we're taking out Melaleuca, right? Like Melaleuca used to be everywhere in South Florida. And now you still see Melaleuca, of course, we haven't eradicated it, we'll never eradicate it. But because we have these areas that now are disturbed, um, that are more easily invaded, these plant species are moving in, right? Like it's, it's super easy for another invasive to come in in the place of one we've just removed. Um, so I have a couple questions for you. So thinking about the, um, the, the feeding studies that you were doing for the potential biocontrols, how long do each one of those last? Like how long does it take you to go through each of those? So the, the feeding studies, like for the want for not the host, the host range. Oh, the host range. Yeah. So, yeah. So when we do those, we set up, um, different cages. So we've got a cage that has ear leaf acacia. And then a cage that has the the non-target plant, right? So the one we're trying to test. We put insects in those and we wait to see if the insects, in the case of larvae, develop. So develop to the next stage and then become adults. Or in the case of the adults, wait until the insects on the non-target die. Um, so, and the reason why we have um, the ear leaf acacia plant is because we want to ensure that the lack of food is what kills an insect, right? Like if the if the insects on the early vacation die, something else has occurred, right? Like the temperature dropped or I, you know, we something very weird happened. And because early vacation is the is the host plant. And so they they typically take on the adults, um, they take anywhere from two weeks to a month, depending on, you know, the the species. Uh the larvae we wait until the larvae develop into adults on the early vacation. So those take a full 30 days. Great. Uh, I see hand raised, Sim Sexton. 
Hi, I'm Matt Sexton. I'm with the Conservation Fund. Um, we are working with Rick Braun and some folks in Martin County to protect lands in the headwaters of the Loxahatchee River and South Fork of the St. Lucie River and the most lands on Bridge Road. It is a corridor that is full of earleaf acacia, Brazilian pepper, uh, Ligodium, and Malaluca. Our um, particular property, 138 acres, is loaded with acacia, loaded with Malaluca. We want to start addressing that. I'm not sure. I was following, listening to your conversation or your points about the succession. Does it matter if we if we had to start with one? If we start with acacia first or Malaluca, or should we do it all at the same time? You know, it's a very costly. Um, we expect it'll be six hundred thousand dollars worth of costs or something to to do this. So we need to stage it. And I'm just wondering if we can stage it. And then are the are the insects once they are available? Um, will they work on just the acacia or will they work on some of the other invasives that we're dealing with? Okay, so um, as far as whether or not you can stage it so that you're not getting uh, invasion of something else, um, you, if you take them out all at once, you're going to have a lot of bare ground, right? Um, if you have a lot of bare ground, you're going to want to consider doing some restoration. So some planting of natives, seeding of natives, um, something to, um, to kind of make that environment healthier. Um, you could take them out a little bit at a, like, you know, one species at a time, uh, then you're not going to have as much bare ground. You're still going to have some. Um, it's, it's a very expensive process. Unfortunately, restoration only makes it more expensive, but if you're, if you're having a lot of bare ground where you've just killed everything, um, even if that said, you've got, you know, a monoculture of Brazilian pepper tree. You take out all of that Brazilian pepper tree all at once. It's the same issue. And so you have to really be cognizant about that and and monitor these areas when you're um after you've done the control, right? To see what is coming back in. And then Thanks. um the these insects that I talked about today will only feed on your early vacation. Now there are other insects. So so we've got um insects for Brazilian pepper tree. So um, reach out. We um, have a grant from APHIS to be able to uh, release these in the state. And so um, reach out if you guys are doing some uh, large scale stuff. We're happy to um, bring insects down, especially if you're doing um, chemical controls. We are um, in the second year of, look, of doing some integrated uh, management uh, things with biological control, grizzly and pepper, and then uh, chemical controls. And so I'm happy to chat with you about that um, after this or at some other time. Um, Ligodium, there are also Ligodium insects. So um, the USDA Invasive Plant Research Lab has um, those insects and you're in that the footprint that they're um, interested in. So you could reach out uh, to them because there's several insects for Ligodium. Awesome. Thank you. I'll reach out. I don't want to take up everybody's time. This isn't my area of expertise. I'm just as a you know, person who buys land trying to figure out and learn a little bit more about the management and addressing um, this particular issue. I was yeah, always reach out. I'm happy to chat with you about it. I was all I always was concerned about biological controls because I keep thinking of that. That she swallowed the spider to catch the fly thing from when I was Yeah. <laughs> well with with um Invasive plant biological control, it's so highly regulated at this point. Like it started being very highly regulated in the 1970s that um, we've had close to zero non, uh, major non-target impacts. Like I think there's one one indication since we started, with, since we changed things up. Um, and so there, it's very, very host specific. Like they will not allow us to release something that that is going to feed um, and reproduce on a native. So like the Brazilian pepper tree thrips, they feed on Brazilian pepper tree. They will also feed and reproduce on Peruvian pepper tree, which is also okay. another invasive. We don't have it in the state. They have it in California. And so that's allowed, right? Like, oh, it's another invasive. It can feed on that. But if it would have fed on some... And, and survived on, you know, one of our natives, that would have been a no-go for sure. Thank you. I see Greg's on the call and uh, we'll get your information, reach out. And if anybody else has any resources or thoughts or is working in Martin County and we can partner with you on it, uh, let me know. 
so we've had another question in the chat. Um, I've seen the horn beetles on sweet acacia. Are there different types of horn beetles and are all horn beetles not native? Uh, so there are many different species of the, of the, is it the, the like the straighter limbatus, the beetle or the, the thorn bug? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, okay. Diane, if you can chime in to help clarify that, please. So if we're talking about the thorn bugs, the then, thorn bug, yes. yes, those do occur on many other different plant species. So those can be a little problematic. I don't know if I would go and say they're they're invasive, but they do occur on many other legume species for sure. Right. Um, so do you still want information on populations in South Florida or are you looking primarily for the leading edge? I We want them all. So we don't think the current map we have is near what, what the current distribution is at all. And so we're definitely missing stuff in South Florida. We're definitely missing stuff on the leading edge. But if you see it, plotted a non-naturalist for us. It doesn't take, but, you know, maybe 30 seconds to be able to do it. And so it's super easy. We get a notification that it's come in and it, it's going to really help um, with the work that we're trying to do. Do you have any tips for identification, um, especially people who are in the leading edge and may not be familiar with it? Like what time of year is it easiest to spot? Um, any good resources so they could learn how to identify it in the field? Yeah, um, and we have a brochure that we just developed that is showing you some of those things, and those um, aren't quite on the website, on my website, but they will be very soon. But um, if you, let's see, I'm going to share my screen again. Pick up the good pictures here. I have so many animations. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, so um, so the leaves um, are unlike other acacias, right? These are phyllodes, these are entire leaves and they look, they're very sickle shaped. Um, they also have these um, yellow spikes of flowers. So those yellow flowers come out uh, in the fall and then in uh, so these are very very tall trees. You'll you'll see seedlings, of course. Um, so this sickle shaped leaf, these uh, yellow flowers, and right now, um, you will have these fruits. So these uh, another common name for this plant is ear pod acacia, which makes more sense because the pod looks like a human ear, like the curling of a human ear. They come out; they're bright lime green. When they mature, they turn brown and start opening and you get these seeds that hang out. So black seeds on these orange arils. You cannot miss this. There's nothing else that we have that that has a fruit um, that looks like this. So sickle shaped leaves. Um, it can be single stemmed, like a single trunk. It can also be multi-stemmed in, in some um, areas, but those yellow flowers, sickle shaped leaves, and then these um, very unique um fruits but um we've got a brochure coming out it's about to be on our website very soon and then um uh to be able to help people so that way you have something handheld to be able to when you're in the field and i naturalist if you're not quite sure if you take a picture of it if you think it's a relief acacia and put in that you don't know what it is it gets id'd it's a really nice part of iNaturalist. yeah we have a, a great community i think in florida for helping with plant id 100 mm percent -hmm. so um it looks like we've got the brochure one of your team i'm assuming has posted that in the chat for us okay um, we have got another um question in too uh do birds spread the seeds the, uh so the seeds are pretty much spread um by insects and water thanks emily for putting in the early facacia brochure um I, I would assume that birds can indeed spread it but we haven't seen it yet um, but that doesn't mean it's not occurring. Very little is known about this plant species um, because it is so such a new invasive. Um, so yeah, we'll be keeping an eye out for birds for sure. But those, the arils, the, so the orange parts of the seed that the seeds fall on, they're sweet. 
And so that makes them very palatable for um, insects. And so I would assume birds as well. Okay, cool. Um, so we had someone asking, it's three more years, I'm assuming for release. Um, I feel like we're drowning on leaf acacia on Pine Island in Lee County. One quarter acre lot near me went from zero to 100% in just four years. Um, so I don't know, you have any thoughts on how things that we can do in the interim or um, things that we can do to help support getting the release sooner? Uh, keep keep your eye out for it. Um, you know, there's a public comment period. And so um, we always welcome positive public comments that, you know, say, yes, we need we need these things. We're trying to get it in as fast as possible. But the federal government moves at the speed of the federal government. <laughs> and so um, we're, we're hoping it'll be less than three years. But my personal experience is that once you um once you submit that thing, it takes about three years to be able to get the the permits. And that's if there's no conflicts of interest, which we're not expecting any with earlification. Um, but yeah, it is a very long process, but um, we're actually way ahead of the game with earlification. But you can continue to do those, you know, mechanical controls, chemical controls of these plants with the amount of seeds that these um, trees are producing. They're just going to continue to spread. Awesome. Well, that was a fantastic presentation. Do we have any more questions before we move on to our update on East Central Florida Sismal? Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Mentier. That was great. We really appreciate it. Great. And we will hand it over to Dr. Wells. Uh, so Dr. Wells is the commercial horticulture agent for the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Brevard County, where she specializes in turf grass and ornamental production and sustainable landscape maintenance. She's a doctor of plant medicine from UF in 2013, with more than 15 years of experience in commercial plant production with expertise in plant pathology, integrated pest management, and pesticide safety and stewardship. Dr. Wells also has a degree in biochemistry from the University of Southern Mississippi, and she is an International Society of Arboricultural Certified Arborist and Florida Friendly Landscaping Certified Professional. Okay, great. Thank you so much for inviting me today to give an update of our East Central Florida SISMA. So um, as Deb so nicely uh, gave you an introduction um, of me, I am Bonnie Wells. I'm the presently the commercial horticulture agent for Brevard County, and I am co-chair of the ECS, um, ECF SISMA, which includes Brevard, Volusia, Flagler, and Putnam counties, along with CJ Green, from the Fish and Wildlife Commission. And I also couldn't go any further in talking about any of our activities with ECS SISMA without giving a huge thank you to Chris Campbell, who is now officially retired from FWC, but um, I actually took over, she uh, stepped down uh, right around the COVID time, about, I guess it was late 2020, from being the chair of ECF SISMA, offered it to me, um, so me and CJ became co-chairs together because we neither one of us were too comfortable with becoming chair. Well, we realized we needed Chris back and she has been nothing but helpful with organization and getting things together. And so we all kind of work together. Chris is still going to help us out and be involved, but uh, me and uh, CJ are co-chairs. And so I'm going to give you a quick update on a few things that we've been doing over the years. And after that, give um, a little um, some points about our present and uh, future needs to keep this SISMA going. All right, I, let's see if I can advance. Like take in a minute, hold on one second. One second, let me reshare or re this. Okay, there we are. Okay, and so um, in the 2021, oh, this is kind of old information, but I like to include it because I'm still proud of it. Um, we created uh, a EDRR uh, uh, field guide for about 14 to 15 different species of the EDRR species in the ECF SISMA. And um, it, we this uh, publication lists detailed descriptions to help you know land managers ID these important species listed for our area. Um, it's a great 
publication. I uh, have the QR code here if you'd like a free electronic copy. Um, I do have some uh, additional in-print copies in my office, which we have reserved for future educational programs. Um, but if you're really interested in having one of those print ones, we may can um, provide you with one of those. And I do have to thank um, you know, FISC for this. They The printing was funded through one of those competitive grants that they give the SISMAs each year uh, in 2021 and 2022. And this uh, publication also, I got to take it to my extension um, award programs and we got a national extension award for this this uh, past year in 2023. So I'm real proud of it. Um, it's a small book, but it's got lots of detailed information in there. And so please just, if you'd like access, you can, um, hopefully that QR code will work for you. If not, I'll have my email at the end where you can get that information. The next thing we did in May of 2023 was we had a really awesome work day, um, along the Lake Washington and St. John's River in, in Brevard County. We got together 16 volunteers from FWC, UF IFAS, that included master naturalist and um, me as an agent. We had people from the Corps of Engineers, the South uh, Johns Water Management District. We got five airboats out on the water and we were targeting um, water primo, so Luigia, and we um, we're able to teach the identification of this uh, invasive plant and we performed hand removal. Um, you know, so we all separated in these five airboats and we got to go around. It was my first time in an airboat, a couple other people's first time in an airboat. And so it was super fun, very educational. And we did remove a lot of Luigia. So at the end, we did weigh, it was um, over 240 pounds in just a, a few hours that we were out there. Um, but it was a, a great success and um, it kind of got everybody really excited going forward with, you know, new work days that we could possibly um, yeah. come up with. Um, we also were able, thanks to the Central Florida CISMA, they um, allowed us to partner with them with the recent Grasses and Sedges workshop um, on October the 24th of 2023 in Apopka at the Wakiba Youth Center. It was very well attended, an awesome program. Education was amazing, um, and it was just great. And so we were there. I did represent ECF CISMA there. Um, and it was just all around great from hands-on learning opportunities to classroom as well. And our next uh, work day, our weed wrangle is coming up. We're super excited about this on March 13th um, in Sunrise Park, as you can see there in Volusia County, um, along the Halifax River. They contacted Chris uh, Campbell um, and said, you know, we have a terrible Brazilian pepper tree uh, population here at Sunrise Park. And, you know, we heard that we can get some help through the SISMAs with uh, trying to remove that. And so we have, um, uh, you know, organized a weed wrangle for March 13th there in Sunrise Park. Um, we are partnered with the City of Holly Hill, FWC, UF IFAS Extension, and the um, Paw Paw Chapter of the Native Plant Society there in Volusia County is going to help us. So um, if you're interested in helping us, we would absolutely love to have you. Um, we are going to do some, you know, we have people that are going to help cut down, we're going to do the treatments, uh, you know, herbicide treatments and, and you know, move that stuff off there. So um, we need all the help we can get. And so if you could just reach out to me by email, if you'd like to do that, we would love to have you. It'll be from eight to two. Publix is going to um, uh, sponsor that. And so they're going to give us free lunch. So that's really exciting. So Holly Hill or bust, right? No, Holly Hill, we're definitely going to bust. So Join us for that, please. And so um, going forward, so we really need a strong steering committee. And I know there's a couple of people out there I've talked to that are on this call that have said they would help us with this, but we need some leadership. We need people to help us. Yes, we have people. We can wrangle volunteers. We can um, put on educational programs and get people to come. But we're really looking, me and CJ, uh, moving forward, we're, we're really looking for some leadership. You know, we want to form a really good steering committee that we don't have. 
We um we have agreed that you know you know every system is different and we're not thinking of every month having a meeting but we really enjoy the work days and that we really want to focus on those work days and so there's really a lot of opportunity for people to help in leadership positions from planning those meetings, workday organizations, uh, social media management. We do have a Facebook page where we post pictures. It's not very active. Um, however, we would like it to be, you know, things like this. So if there's anybody out there in, in, in the area of ECF SISMA that would be willing to um, step in with some of these leadership positions, please contact me. Um, you know, we're open to ideas. We're both passionate, you know, about what we're doing, but it's a lot of work, you know, being full-time employees and doing other things. We, we need some other leadership going in. So if this sounds good to you, um, you know, reach out to me. This is my email address. You can also find me on Twitter. Um, you know, so that's all I have today. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. But again, we have the March 13th work day coming up and we would love to have you in Holly Hill. So reach out to me if you're interested in that or interested in any of those leadership positions or just involved or being on our listserv to get information about what we're doing and maybe you can join us. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Wells. Do we have any questions? All right, well, I have a um, few updates going on. Let me get everything ready to share my screen again. All right, can you all see everything okay? All right, so upcoming events. Um, all of these are on our statewide calendar of Florida Invasives um, dash upcoming events. We have a lot really going on over the next month. Lots of work days, several different meetings, but I wanna highlight a few in particular. So next week, Osceola Sisma is having a um, herbicide use workshop. And that's a free workshop with six CEUs, including two core. So you can uh, look on their Sisma website or the statewide uh, calendar to find details on that to uh, sign up through Eventbrite. Um, the week of uh, first full week of February, we've got two great workshops. Uh, Heartland Sisma has a fundamentals of herbicide workshop in Lakeland, and they'll have up to three CEUs. I'm not certain what the final amount on that is yet. Um, also, uh, you can sign up for that through Eventbrite. Um, and then there's Six River Sisma is doing a regional lionfish workshop up in Fort Walton Beach. Um, next one I want to focus on: uh, North Central Florida Sisma is doing a feral hog workshop in Lake City. Um, those details uh, are on their SISMA calendar if you want to find out how to sign up for that, just emailing their SISMA leads. Looking beyond that uh, into um, uh, lead wrangle, so uh, NISA is the last week of February spreading into um, early March, so that'll be uh, about the time of our next monthly call. And we have a lot going on for both NISA and the weed wrangle events across the state. Um, so uh, you see a long list here, uh, the website, um, I will hopefully be getting that updated this week or early next week at the latest, you can find more information on all the different events there. Uh, some announcements to make sure everyone is aware of. Uh, so the Florida Python Control Plan has a new website that's pretty much a one-stop shop for all things Python. So go check that out if you haven't already. Um, there have been some new things added in to FWC or so CAPES um, uh, Aquatics Resource Management Guides. So there's a lot of really cool stuff in there. I forget some of the new species that were added in, but really good resources on different treatment methods, specifics for um, uh, some of the species that we're battling here. Uh, and finally, the Fisk Invasive Symposium, you should see information on the agenda and registration coming out later this week or early next week. I uh, do want to give some thanks. We have had some changing of the guard with some of our SISMAs. So um, outgoing, we have uh, Shannon Carnavale from Heartland Sisma, and also Alex Anisco and Mike Giston for Treasure Coast. Um, and they're being replaced by Max Sawinski from Heartland Sisma and uh, Antonio Rodriguez and Carrie Finch on Treasure Coast. And um, you know, a lot of great work done by the uh, past uh, Sisma leads and already seeing lots of great stuff from the incoming ones. So I want to thank all the Sisma leads and particularly these for everything that they do because they really drive these local events and these local groups um, bring so much value to all of us. Uh, final bit is uh, just looking at our schedule. We've got our, our full calendar for this coming year. I'm really excited about some of the topics we'll be able to offer. And all the calls are recorded and they are posted up on our uh, YouTube channel. So if you are, are unable to miss one or want to come back and see what some of the content was again, you can check those. 
And uh, that's it. Did we have any more questions? Uh, we got some additional info in on um, some additional weed wrangles for e-sysma and treasure coast sysma. But any other comments or questions before we end the meeting today? I want to thank everyone for your time. Thank you to Dr. Mentier and Dr. Wells for your presentations. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Uh, enjoy your uh, late winter and have a happy Nissan weed wrangle. <laughs>